This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A few notes before we start the show. I'm all signed up for the True Crime Podcast Festival in Kansas City next year, the weekend of July 11th. If you're going, get your tickets early before the prices go up. The podcast took a bit of a break this fall. I've had a lot of things going on in my life for the last few weeks, but I've brought in some research help for the show, and hopefully we will be on a twice-a-month release schedule in 2020. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. Green Bay, Wisconsin has a population of 100,000 and is full of blue-collar, hard-working, salt-of-the-earth type people. It's a city that was built on washing your Friday night fish fry down with an old-fashioned, calling out a schmear during your Saturday night sheep's head card game, and yelling at your TV during the Sunday Packer football game. Green Bay is known for its paper mills, which have traditionally offered some of the best benefits, pay, and free paper products that a high school educated person can get. When someone lands a paper mill job, they stay there until retirement. If you haven't worked at a paper mill, you probably know someone who does. Many of my family and friends worked at the James River Paper Mill in Green Bay. I worked there for four summers, and that allowed me to get through college with very little debt. And if you used Northern toilet paper in the mid to late 90s, I likely hand-packed it. In 1993, They found a James River employee dead in one of the pulp vats. Two and a half years later, in the spring of 1995, six paper mill employees were arrested for the murder. I first stepped foot inside the James River paper mill one month after their arrests, and you could still feel the turmoil in the air. The news media around this case was unrelenting and was very one-sided. This case has always bothered me because there were so many purported facts that made little sense and the state's theory seemed unreasonable. As the years after their incarceration ticked by, more flaws with the case surfaced. The Innocence Project of Minnesota got involved and helped the convicted men with the appeals process. The Innocence Project carefully reviews cases, and there's a high bar to clear to receive their help. This case is complex and ultimately frustrating. You're listening to Episode 13, The Mon File 6. Thirty-five-year-old Tom Monfile's life had mostly revolved around paper products and marched into the beat of his own drum. In childhood, he delivered newspapers while riding around on a unicycle. As an adult, he spent a few years doing search and rescue for the Coast Guard. But it wouldn't be long before he took a job at James River Paper Company in Green Bay, Wisconsin, in 1983. Working at James River was a family affair, Tom's father had also worked at the paper mill for 36 years. Tom was a loyal company man, the type of person any business owner would be thrilled to employ. He wanted to do everything he could to help the company. He believed in James River and wanted to be part of their success. Tom was an exceedingly straight-laced man and didn't waste his time on cigarettes or alcohol. He had a tremendous amount of personal drive, and he dreamed big. Tom worked as much overtime as he could get, at a $17 per hour wage, which was very good in the early 90s for a person without a college degree. When he wasn't working big hours at the paper mill, he would purchase and remodel homes. Tom was the proud owner of four homes in the Green Bay area, and even owned one cottage. Tom Monfile's strong sense of company loyalty would bring drama into his work life in the fall of 1992. Tom called the police on Tuesday, November 10th, and anonymously reported a theft at James River. His co-worker, Keith Kutzka, had planned to take an electrical cord from the company on his way to badge out. Tom feared Keith Kutzka and told police that Keith was a crazy biker type with a known history of violence. Historically, 
there was a good reason to be concerned about bikers from the Green Bay area. The murder of Margaret Anderson in the 1980s showed how dangerous the underground biker culture was. Tom had a unique problem in that Keith was his union steward, and Tom could not go to him to get this issue resolved. Police took the information from Tom, but did not launch an official investigation. Per Green Bay Police Department protocol, they had recorded their call with Tom. Green Bay PD told Tom that he should call his company's security about the theft that had not yet taken place. Tom wanted the police to make the call, because he didn't want to jeopardize his job. Green Bay PD Communications Center operator Michelle Wickman had taken the call with Tom Monfiles and subsequently placed a call to James River Security to warn them about the impending theft. She documented nothing in the computer system about placing the call to James River Security since the police had not physically traveled to James River. The only record of Tom's call was the tape that the police recorded on. James River was enclosed by fencing with a security gatehouse, where each employee walked through to badge in or out. Keith Kutzka was heading out of work around 6.30 when he was stopped by security, and they asked to see his bag. Since he had a company cord neatly tucked away in his bag, he refused to submit to the search. Keith just kept walking to his car, and he didn't stop for anyone. He wanted to use that 15-foot cord in his barn. Keith's decision to defy the company's security was met with substantial consequences. His union rep said to not admit to anything, and he would have a better chance of keeping his job. At his disciplinary meeting, the company gave Keith a five-day unpaid suspension from work for not submitting to the search. A human resources representative told Keith that a James River employee had placed a call to the police. The police had placed a call to security prompting them to want to search his bag. Keith figured that it was a manager who called the police, but he would soon learn that one of his co-workers was the rat. Tom Monfiles called Green Bay PD again on Thursday, November 12th. He told Officer Denise Cervais that he was scared and wanted to ensure that they kept the recorded call from the 10th confidential, and he did not want that tape released to anyone. Denise reassured Monfiles that the call would not be released. There was no report made in the computer system that Tom had placed another call to Green Bay PD. Keith Kutzka placed a call to police on Tuesday, November 17th. He told them that a co-worker was trying to frame him, and as a result, they docked him five days' pay. Keith wanted a copy of the anonymous call. Back at the paper mill, Keith let his co-workers know that he would get a copy of that tape and find the rat who got him into trouble. Tom Monfiles called the police the night of the 17th because it scared him that Keith would figure out he had made the call. Tom spoke with Officer Kenneth Latour, and he thought that they could not release the tape. Officer Latour also did not document the call. He told Tom to follow up with another officer who worked with the Green Bay Communications Department. Tom called the next day on Wednesday, November 18th, and spoke with Officer John Lampkin. He reassured Tom that the tape would not be released because those requests had to go through him. Officer Lampkin did not immediately document this call, but documented it later after the unfortunate sequence of events took place. Keith called Officer Mason on Thursday, November 19th and was pressing on the Green Bay PD to get a copy of that call. There had been no documentation of all the prior calls and interactions between the Green Bay Police Department and Thomas Monfiles. Officer Mason did not check with any of his fellow officers, but spoke with one of the city's attorneys. They decided it was okay to release the tape to Keith, even though Officer Mason was not technically the person who released records. As far as Officer Mason knew, there had been no promises made to keep the tape anonymous. Officer Mason told Keith to bring a blank cassette tape and $5 to the police station. They would make a copy of the tape for him. Keith was thrilled and announced at work he was picking up the tape after his shift was over. Tom overheard this and called the police in a panic on Friday, November 20th. He told the detective the whole story from the beginning. 
Deputy Chief of Detectives, John Taylor, assured Tom that Petey would not release the tape. The detective did nothing to follow up on the situation. Had Detective Taylor asked around the office, the tape for Keith was sitting on a desk near him. Tom was still nervous and called Assistant DA Pat Hitt. DA Hitt dialed up Detective Taylor. The DA emphasized that even though there was open records laws in Wisconsin, that this tape would be exempt and it was not to be released under any circumstances. Detective Taylor stated that he was familiar with the case since he had just recently spoken with Tom Monfiles. He assured the DA that he would take care of the situation. Detective Taylor looked in the computer system and could not find a report about the call. He never checked with anyone in the department, including Officer Lampkin, who handled all the records requests. Detective Taylor assumed that this tape didn't exist, and he took no further action other than heading out of town to go deer hunting. Keith stopped by the police station, and Green Bay PD gave him a copy of the anonymous call. When he listened to the recording, he immediately recognized Tom's voice. Keith brought the tape of Tom into work at James River the next day and played it for Marilyn Charles, who was the union's president. Marilyn told Keith to play the tape for Tom to see if he could get a confession, that it was him on the tape. Marilyn also told Keith to make sure his co-workers were present to witness the admission the union president stressed that everything needed to stay civil and no threats were to be made. If Keith got Tom to admit that he was the anonymous caller, then the local 327 union would take action. This was quickly turning into a major situation because a paper mill worker had to be part of the United Paper Workers International Union to stay employed at James River. If the union kicked a person out, it meant that they lost their job. Keith brought the tape to work early on Saturday, November 21st, and played it for anyone willing to listen. Keith took his co-worker, Randy Leepak, into Control Room 7 to play the tape for Monfiles. Mike Piaskowski, better known as Mike Pye, was already in the room working with Tom. Mike was known for being even-keeled. Keith was likely counting on the fact that Pye would make a good witness while ensuring everyone remained well-mannered. At 7.13 a.m., Keith played the tape, and a look of astonishment ran across Tom's face. Keith asked Tom if that was him on the tape. Tom admitted that it was. When Keith asked Tom why he had done this to him, Tom said that he had a stake in the company and a future to be concerned about. No one in the room really understood what that meant. Keith said if Tom had a problem with him, he should have just told him. Keith left Control Room 7. Mike Pye also questioned Monfiles and wanted to know why he would do that to a co-worker. There were no concrete answers, and Tom said very little. Tom left the room at 7.30 to put a new roll of paper on the machine, which was called a turnover. During that time, Keith called the union president to ask if he had everything necessary to file a grievance against Monfiles. They completed the turnover around 7.34. Laboratory technician Connie Jones saw Tom completing his tasks at 7.38 when she walked into control room 9, where Keith Kutzka worked. He played the tape for her, so when she left the room at 7.45, she purposefully looked to see if Tom was still stewing from the morning's drama, but he was nowhere to be found. Mike Pye contacted a foreman at 7.56 a.m., because Tom was missing from his workstation, and a turnover had to be finished without him. At 8.15, a few people began searching for Tom. Some paper mill employees wondered if the tape had created so much inner turmoil that maybe Tom left work. When Tom didn't return home, after his scheduled shift, his wife called James River and insisted that they look for him. The next day, on Saturday, November 22, 1992, they found Thomas Monfiles at the bottom of a 20,000-gallon paper pulp vat inside of James River. Police drained the two-story vat and found Tom's body had been mutilated from the vat's large propellers. 
He had a 50-pound weight tied around his neck with a jump rope that he had kept at work. Instead of ruling the death a suicide, the medical examiner determined that Tom Monfell's death was due to homicide. Tom's autopsy showed that he was strangled from the rope and asphyxiated from the paper pulp. His head had been beaten and they broke his ribs. It wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to say that the Green Bay Police Department set up residence inside of the James River paper mill. They spent many hours interviewing paper mill employees from their makeshift office. The citizens of Green Bay were angry with Green Bay PD and also with the James River Paper Mill Union. One year had passed, and no arrests had been made. This case quickly grew to the level of being one of the most publicized crimes in the history of the city. The police were under an immense amount of pressure to solve the crime. Most people aren't aware that the government has no constitutional obligation to protect its citizens. This central theme has come up in several court cases, with the most prominent being Warren versus the District of Columbia. This was a horrific situation, where police were called twice to the scene of a serious crime that was in progress, and they didn't investigate. The result was, the captors held three women in an apartment for 14 hours, where they were raped and beaten. The court ruled that the police were not bound by any legal duty to protect or save its citizens. The open records law in Wisconsin has been around since the early 1980s. Citizens are entitled access to any governmental agency document, regardless of the form of the information. With the Green Bay Police Department and Tom Monfiles, the police didn't start an investigation, so they didn't have to keep Tom's recorded call protected. When Tom repeatedly called the police and begged them to keep his call anonymous, he was unaware that they had stacked the legal universe against him. The last police officer Tom spoke with opted to go deer hunting instead of searching for the tape. The lack of duty to protect ruling, combined with the police department not exercising good judgment around the open records law, helped create a perfect storm that allowed this tragedy to happen. This led to the passing of the Monfiles Act in October 1993, which safeguarded the identity of informants who were working with police. In January 1994, Detective Randy Winkler took over as the lead investigator on the Monfiles murder, and it won't be long before the case broke wide open. On November 29, 1994, a paper mail employee named Brian Kellner had a strong piece of evidence. Brian had been 20 miles north of Green Bay drinking at the Fox Den Bar with Keith Kutzka earlier that summer. Brian said Keith confessed to murdering Monfiles and even performed a reenactment. In his reenactment, some paper mill employees had called Monfiles a snitch. Five other paper mill workers had all shouted at Monfiles. Then someone hit him with a wrench or a board, and they tossed him into the pulp vat. On April 12, 1995, they charged six men from James River with the murder of Thomas Monfiles. It was two and a half years after his death. Keith Kutzka, Mike Hearn, Ray Moore, Mike Piaskowski, Dale Baston, and Michael Johnson were arrested and all charged with murder. They had all been seen at Monfile's control room station. They would come to be known as the Monfile Six. Marilyn Charles, who was the union president, and Randy Lee Pack, who was present when the tape was played for Monfile's, were both arrested and charged with misdemeanors. They decided that the six men would be tried together on September 26, 1995. The murder trial lasted five weeks. The news of the murder was so pervasive in Green Bay and the outlying areas that the jury was selected from Racine County, which was five counties away. The prosecutors took the approach that the six men had acted like mob brothers who were driven by union loyalty to where they would commit murder together. The state's theory was that Keith confronted Monfiles in control room 7. Then Keith, Tom, Pye, and Lee Peck had all been there. Brian Kellner was one of the state's top witnesses who testified to Keith's drunken murder reenactment and also testified that a second confrontation happened by a bubbler. There were two other star witnesses for the prosecution, David Weiner 
saw two of the men carrying Monfell's body on the morning he went missing. James Gilliam was a jailhouse snitch who proclaimed that Ray Moore confessed the murder to him. On October 28, 1995, all six men were guilty of being party to first-degree intentional homicide, which came with life sentences. After the murder trial, there was a civil case against the officers of the city of Green Bay. The trial intended to address if police put the life of one of its citizens in danger or not. The police testified to doing nothing wrong and said they acted in good faith. The defense attorney for Green Bay PD said that Monfiles contributed to the tape being released because he did not identify himself, therefore police didn't document it. The defense team tried to use the famous Wisconsin case of DeShaney v. Winnebago, which was decided by the Supreme Court. This was another case that determined the government has no duty to protect you. They gave Randy DeShaney custody of his four-year-old son, Joshua, after a divorce in 1980. He abused the boy to where the child went to the hospital. DSS intervened and had several home visits with the father, and there was still evidence of abuse. DSS did not move to get the child out of the home. Then the father beat Joshua to where he suffered brain damage and was institutionalized. When Joshua's mom sued the county, she lost. Randy DeShaney served two years for his child abuse conviction, and Joshua died a few years ago. He was 36. But for the Monfiles civil case, the U.S. Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals viewed it differently than the DeShaney-Winnebago outcome. The court determined that Green Bay PD created danger that led to Tom's death, and at a minimum, citizens have a right to not be placed in harm's way by their police force. Officers Taylor, Cervais, Latour, Lampkin, and Mason were all specifically on trial for negligence. Officer Taylor, the officer who went deer hunting, was found to be the most negligent party of everyone. He was the most culpable because he had talked to both Tom and the DA and fully understood the situation. The civil suit was originally filed by Susan Monfiles in May 1993 against the Green Bay PD and was settled on June 16, 1997. They awarded Susan Monfiles $638,000, and her two children received $650,000 each. In 2012, Susan Monfiles finally dropped a 19-year-old civil lawsuit against the six men, which was on hold as the men worked their way through the appeals process. We're going to take a quick break to tell you about a new true crime podcast with a unique perspective. The investigation into the high school massacre Parkland is... Parkland High School massacre. At least 14 dead, 50 injured. 13 people were killed today in a mass shooting. That includes a suspected gunman. Coming soon, Active Shooter, a podcast that studies the psychology, motives, and methods behind some of the most notorious active shooters in North America and beyond. East Alameda Avenue. They're saying somebody's shooting in the auditorium. We will discuss the whys, the hows, and most importantly, the proposed solutions. Can the proper mix of mental health services and gun access put a stop to what has now become an accepted everyday occurrence? Have we become desensitized and accepting of this new phenomenon? Join us as we break down each case and discuss the failures that led to each event and how we can identify and stop them in the future. Join us soon, and please subscribe to Active Shooter. If it were up to an individual like Detective Randy Winkler or Prosecutor John Zakowski, this is where the story of the Monfile 6 would end. But not so fast. We need to back up. It took time, money, books being written, Innocence Project involvement, witnesses flipping, exonerations, proof of police corruption, and Tom's brother testifying at Keith Kutzka's evidentiary hearing, which helped the public understand that this story was not as straightforward as it was initially presented. Let's return to the day Tom's body was found. It would be fair to say that Green Bay PD did a subpar job handling the crime scene. The area was not secured, 
and many male employees cross through the crime scene during the workday. Green Bay PD were caught on their own videotape disturbing important areas like the tissue chest. Police fail to immediately separate potential witnesses. Temperature readings or samples of the tissue chest were not taken. Tom's body had been in the tank for 36 hours, and no one took measurements of his body in relation to the tank's propellers, which would have helped determine how much damage it could have inflicted on him. When his body was moved out through the tank's portal, potential evidence went into the company's drainage system. The propeller from the vat was never taken into evidence. There was no evidence of an attack found on the crime scene, which was peculiar, given that this was the state's theory. There was no blood, no weapons, and no witnesses. The detective even threatened employees, telling them that they were either a witness or a suspect. This tactic produced zero witnesses. There were some issues with Tom's autopsy. The original medical examiner never visited the pulp chest. The damage done to Monfell's skull was not compared to the propellers in the vat. In a later appeals process, another medical examiner reviewed Tom's autopsy and said that she would have listed his death as unknown. Based on what they know now, versus 1992, it's difficult to distinguish if a particular injury happened prior to or post-death. The original medical examiner, who was now deceased, made a misstep but was just doing their best for the knowledge they had at the time. The police didn't examine the possibility that Tom might have committed suicide, since the original medical examiner quickly ruled it a homicide. Police never investigated or considered Monfell's psychological state of mind or medication history leading up to his death. Luminol testing confirmed that there was no blood where the theoretical beating took place. The suicide theory would have explained why there was no blood found at the crime scene. The police department might have also been in favor of not considering a suicide theory because they were the ones who released the tape to Keith and didn't want to put themselves on the hook for a suicide. After they found Tom in the vat, Susan Monfiles told Tom's parents and brother that she thought her husband maybe killed himself because of stress. Tom's co-workers thought he had psychological issues because of some of the strange behaviors he exhibited at work. Tom sometimes lacked decorum. He would post news articles of his co-workers' DUI arrests around the mill and would write his own inappropriate comments on the edge of the news clippings. One time, a co-worker had a premature baby, and Tom posted about it on paper mill bulletin boards. Management was considering firing Tom for this behavior, but a longtime co-worker stepped in and convinced them that Tom needed his job. Tom would speak about death, drowning, suicide, and the amount of weight required to keep a body underwater with his co-worker, Stephen Stein. Stephen told police about these conversations and thought Monfiles had killed himself. The detective tried to pressure Stephen into saying that he thought Monfiles was beaten. When Stephen refused, Detective Randy Winkler threatened his job and called him a scumbag. Tom told some of his co-workers that doctors had treated him for depression. Tom's brother believed that Tom might have killed himself, and had testified that Tom was a proficient knot tire because of his time spent in the Coast Guard. The rope around Tom's neck was tied with two half hitches, which is used to attach the end part of a rope to an object. Detective Winkler told Tom's brother that the police had already determined that Tom didn't tie the knots but then didn't explain how this determination was made. One important note about Keith stealing the cord. At first glance, this sounds like a grave infraction, but what wasn't really explained was the culture of the department and the rules for taking James River property. James River employees could take certain items home with them, but they were supposed to ask permission for management and fill out official paperwork called Scrap Pass. This program served a dual purpose. It was a reward to employees, and it benefited the company since they didn't have to pay a disposal fee to get rid of the scrap items. Keith chose to just take the cord, but it was customary that many people in his department did not bother with filling out the official scrap pass paperwork when they took something home. If many people in that department bypassed filling out this paperwork, why would Tom call the police over this? No one can be certain but some speculate 
that Tom and Keith were on the opposite sides of a union vote on a particular initiative, and Tom wanted to create an inconvenient situation for Keith. Monfils also told Green Bay PD that Kutzka was a violent biker type, but police can never find a record or any evidence of violence. One of the prosecutor's key witnesses was a James River employee named David Weiner. David's original statement to police said that he was taking a break, having a smoke with Keith, right after he played the tape for Monfiles. Keith was looking at the union handbook and was trying to figure out what grievances he could file against Tom. David later changed his statement and claimed that he was wrong about the timing of the smoke break with Keith. And just like that, Keith's alibi evaporated into thin air. David initially denied seeing Dale Baston and Michael Johnson on the morning of Tom's disappearance. The district attorney, John Zakowski, accused David of being part of the conspiracy and said that he would be labeled a suspect. Then in May 1993, a few months after Monfell's death, David experienced what was called a repressed memory and told investigators that he saw Michael Johnson and Dale Baston two of the Monfile six, quote, bent over as if they were carrying something through the room, and that object was something of substantial weight. This was at 6.30 a.m. on the day Tom disappeared. David claimed the men headed down toward the pulp vat where Tom was found. However, he did not see what the two men were carrying. This repressed memory came to him when he was drunk at a wedding, and he immediately went down to the police station that night. Interestingly enough, by the time trial came around, that carrying something heavy statement changed to carrying Monfell's body, and the time changed from between 6.30 and 7.15 a.m. when Tom was alive to between 7.30 and 8 a.m. when Tom was missing. Dale and Michael Johnson didn't even work in Monfell's area and were just helping on the morning of the incident. That was the first time Michael had been in that area for over a year. Unfortunately. There were some important facts about star witness Dave Weiner that the jury never heard. Dave had mental health issues and was being pharmaceutically treated for anxiety. When Dave testified at the Monfiles trial, he was doing time for killing his brother Tim. Dave got into an argument about a small issue with his brother that had escalated over the phone. Tim told Dave that he was going to narc on him. Tim's fiance overheard this phone argument and believed that this narking had something to do with Dave and the Monfiles case. She later put this information in an affidavit. Tim got in his car and drove to Dave's house to talk with him in person. In the meantime, Dave called their mom and said if his brother showed up at his home, Dave was going to open fire on him. He declared that he was locked and loaded. What happened next was so disturbing that it seemed like it was something out of a Tarantino film. Dave was ready, sitting on the stairs by the front door, with two handguns sitting in his lap. When Tim walked through the front door, Dave blew him away with multiple shots as his son and wife watched TV in the basement family room. The day after Dave killed his brother, D.A. John Zakowski let him walk out of prison on $10,000 bond. Instead of being charged with first-degree intentional homicide, Dave was charged with second-degree reckless homicide, in part because he claimed self-defense. As Dave sat in jail, he said that he would not testify at the Monfiles trial. That was until Detective Randy Winkler visited him in the Oshkosh Correctional Institute, where he was being housed. This was later verified when Dave's lawyer sent Detective Winkler a letter telling him to not contact his client, and all communication must go through his law office. After this visit with the detective, Dave was willing to testify for the prosecution. It would be accurate to say Dave technically received nothing in return for testifying against Keith Kutzka, but when Dave's legal team asked the state for a sentence reduction during his hearing, the prosecution did not object. The judge mentioned that Dave's help with the Monfels case played a role in the decision for a reduced sentence. As a result, Dave's 10-year prison sentence was cut short to eight years, of which he only served three. Dave had been working alone at James River on the day of Tom's disappearance, and he worked close to the vat where Tom was found. Dave was never considered a serious person of interest, but perhaps this should have been scrutinized. When Tom was initially found deceased, 
Dave took it upon himself to contact the police to let them know where he had been on the morning of Monfell's disappearance. He originally made several statements about timelines that were shown later to be false. Dave took an extended leave from work a few weeks after Tom died. They found a fake suicide note in the phone book in Control Room 7, where Tom had worked. The state's forensic handwriting expert determined that the six defendants had not written it, and the note was most likely crafted by Dave himself. David Weiner injected himself into the investigation by having that recovered memory, which conveniently pointed the finger at his co-workers. But there was no need to look at him as a suspect, since the prosecutor said in his closing statement, that there was one certain fact. If Dave Weiner wrote that note, he didn't kill Thomas Monfels. There are five inmates that have stated on record that Dave implied he was involved in the killing of Thomas Monfels, a pipe was used, and Dale and Michael never carried a body anywhere. Another one of the state's star witnesses was James River employee Brian Kellner. Brian had been known for not being the most truthful person. He was a one-upper. When someone told the story, Brian was the guy who would always counter with a taller tale. One summer night in 1994, Keith Kutzka and Brian Kellner went drinking at the Fox Den Bar. Brian testified that Keith told him that he killed Monfiles. The Fox Den Bar incident had been one of the key pieces of the prosecution's case. After signing a statement for police and the prosecution, Brian Kellner admitted that Keith never reenacted or admitted to Tom's murder. Brian signed that original damning statement in part because he was tired of the two-day-long police interview he endured, which included an eight-hour stretch. He just wanted it to be over. Brian told another friend at the paper mill that he lied to appease police because he was afraid of losing his job. Detective Winkler had picked up Brian's kids after school and brought them to Brian's house, telling him that CPS was opening a child abuse investigation. Brian admitted that Detective Winkler manipulated and used him. Winkler told him that police already knew about the second confrontation at the bubbler from secret tapes they obtained. So they concocted the bubbler confrontation when Detective Winkler helped Kellner construct a statement. Ironically, Brian was not even at work the day Tom Monfels disappeared because he was hunting. He had no first-hand knowledge of this alleged incident. Some of the things Brian came up with in statements to police and in his court testimony were heard second-hand from others at work. The bubbler confrontation was never confirmed by any of the 100-plus mill workers that were interviewed over that two-year time period and this was under constant threats and reminders from James River management to their employees. If they didn't cooperate with police, they would be terminated. The paper mill had some of the highest paying jobs in the city, and many workers were making more than people with college degrees. Withholding information at the risk of losing this kind of income was a path employees were not willing to take. The Fox Den bartenders, who were the owners, testified that no such murder reenactment took place. Detective Winkler tried to threaten them, but the couple stood firm. It was unethical to agree to an incident that they know never happened. The detective said the bar owners were lying to protect their patrons. But the truth was that the Fox Den owners barely knew Keith Kutzka. He was not a regular in their bar. Brian Kellner tried to set the record straight after he signed the statement for Detective Winkler. But the police and the DA did not respond to his protests. Brian wanted to correct his statement one week prior to the trial starting. Winkler threatened him again, saying if he changed his statement that he would lose his job and face perjury charges. After the trial, and before his own death, Brian signed an affidavit to set the record straight. This document noted all the threats that Detective Winkler laid at his feet. The truth on that summer night in the Fox Den bar was that Keith and Brian were just trying to figure out what really happened to Tom Monfiles because they truly did not know. During that time in Green Bay, if police interviewed you, they wrote your statement for you, and then you signed it. This was a poor practice, since writing from the investigator's perspective might not capture the tone or the language of the interviewee. 
There might be straight-up inaccuracies, be it intentional or accidental. The interviewee might be nervous or inexperienced and might not check or reread the statement that was written for them. They might feel hurried to sign the statement. Detective Winkler showed up at James River employee Steve Sign's home one day after having interviewed him. The detective told Steve that he forgot to sign a statement from the day before. What transpired was a perfect demonstration of the dishonest tactics Detective Winkler used in his work. Just as Steve was about to sign what he thought was a statement, Steve's wife told him to put that pen down and not to sign the document until he went through it. Steve read the statement, and it contained information that he knew he never said. There were falsehoods placed in the document to frame Mike Pye. Steve immediately tore the paper up. Turns out, his original statement to police had been signed, and Winkler was trying to manipulate him. Stephen has even half-joked that if his wife had not intervened that day, everyone might be saying the Monfile 7. Ray Moore was the only African-American man of the Monfile 6. He also had a police record from when he was a minor, which likely caused additional worry when dealing with Green Bay police. Winkler inappropriately badgered him to try to fluster Ray Moore. Winkler told Ray the other five men were calling him racial slurs and implicated him in the murder. Winkler wrote out a statement for Ray that said Ray was with Tom and the other men when the confrontation started. They beat Tom up and everyone thought he was dead. Then a few of the guys tossed him into the vat. When Ray read the statement, he refused to sign it because he knew it never happened. All six men passed lie detector testing, even though Detective Winkler had done things like pound on the window to the exam room, trying to provoke a spike in the test. The attorneys representing the Monfile Six had never led a capital murder case, which wasn't necessarily a deal-breaker, but it strengthened the state's position. All six were tried together, which brought about additional complications for the defendants. Not only were they battling the prosecutor, but they were battling each other. Mike Pye's lawyer was excited about a potential juror that was a retired union mill worker. Ray Moore's lawyer struck that mill worker from the jury pool. Why? Because he had to strike someone. Some jurors were seen taking naps during the trial. One juror admitted that they couldn't keep the defendant straight. After the trial, another juror said that the case was so complicated that it was just too much to process, and it was just easier to make the same guilty decision for all six men. At trial, the prosecution painted the six men as mobsters who were upholding the code of the Emerita. This was a sacred brotherhood, and these men took part in a perverse union conspiracy. The state didn't mention that these men were different ages and were from different local unions, 327 and 213. Typically, these brotherhoods disband quickly after the reality of a life in prison sentence sinks in, none of the six men have ever turned on the other for an immunity agreement, even after two decades in prison. In Green Bay PD records, there were some accusations that the six men made against each other, but only when forced by the police to speculate. Some of the accusations were, management asked Ray Moore if he knew anything about Monfiles disappearing, and Mike Kern thought Moore looked nervous when he answered the questions. Dale Baston heard that Mike Hearn and Tom Monfiles had a strained work relationship and thought maybe he pushed Monfiles into the vat. Dale was also certain that Kutzka knew the truth about how Monfiles died. Mike Pye thought Moore, Hearn, and Baston were potential suspects. Keith Kutzka thought maybe Dale Baston or Michael Johnson may have committed the crime. Ray Moore thought Kutzka was setting him up to take the fall. Detectives in the Green Bay Police Department kept detail sheets. It's basically the detective's copy of what happened during an interview. It contains the detective's thoughts, opinions, and notes which might include information that was not substantiated. Winkler went back and altered a detail sheet that was produced two years prior and added information that implicated Dale Baston. During the trial, Winkler admitted what he had done because the defense attorney had a copy of the original detail sheet and also the altered one. This was largely discovered based on various format changes 
detectives had used during different time periods in the Green Bay PD. They also caught Winkler falsifying information in a detail sheet related to phone calls that Keith made on the morning Tom went missing. He had stated that Ray Moore had witnessed the calls when Ray was actually not present and could not confirm that information. Keith made two calls at 7.21 and 7.24 a.m., verified by phone records. This falsification was important for Winkler's case, because Moore had shown up to control room 9, Keith's work area, around 7.40 a.m., but Winkler then placed Moore at the scene at 7.20 during the phone calls. This was how Winkler made the bubbler confrontation timeline work. Laboratory technician Connie Jones had also stated there wasn't time for anyone to hurt mon files, and this falsification of the detail sheet helped create that time. Mike Pye stated that, at 7.03 a.m., a paper break took place during the turnover. Mike felt that investigators thought he was lying because the MeasureX computer printout said this event occurred at 7.18. MeasureX was a computer system that recorded and measured the downtime that elapsed when a paper break occurred. This was an emergency of sorts. The control room operators would jump in and assist with getting a paper machine on track again. Rob Miller was an outside consultant who created the MeasureX computer system and explained why the paper break did not happen at 718. That time on the printout was when it reported the break, not when the break happened. Based on how the consultant knew the computer system to work, this paper break happened between 649 and 715, which put Mike Pye's assertion of 703 right in the middle of that time frame. So, why is this important? Winkler pressured lab tech Connie Jones to say that she had seen Monfiles after the paper break, the 718 concocted paper break. They threatened her with being charged as part of the conspiracy. Why did she agree to this? Without a court order, police looked at Connie's bank records and saw that she had just made a large deposit. Green Bay PD said that she had taken a bribe from Ray Moore since they were both African Americans. The money Connie deposited was an inheritance from her family, and a probate court ordered her to deposit the money. At the trial, they pressured her into saying she saw a paper break at 718. The irony was that, years later, Connie was moved to different jobs around the mill. She ended up working as a fourth hand on the infamous Paper Machine 7. She now knows the difference between a paper break and a turnover. She knows that she did not witness a paper break, and certainly did not witness one at 718. Connie saw Monfiles cleaning up after the 734 turnover. Turnovers happen, repeatedly. Paper breaks are different because they are an urgent problem or malfunction. Pete Delvo, a fourth hand on machine 7, confirmed the timing of the turnover. He was cleaning up the machine approximately 15 minutes after the 734 turnover. It was his job to clean up the paper dust after it was blown from the machine by the third hand, who was Tom Monfiles. Connie had seen Dale, Michael, and Keith in Coop 9. When she left the room, she saw Pi, and later saw Ray, all within a few minutes of each other, during the state's purported bubbler confrontation was said to have happened, but not witnessed by anyone. The prosecutor ran with the 718 paper break time. They did not even bother interviewing Rob Miller, the utmost expert and the creator of the MeasureX system that recorded the paper break. Instead of having Rob Miller, the state had a chemical engineer and manager from James River testify. Anyone who has worked at a factory job has probably experienced the frustration when working with engineers. They don't know the small and important details of how machines or systems work because they are not performing the work like a line-level employee does. The MeasureX computer system was no exception. In court, chemical engineer Tony Barco interpreted the MeasureX readouts incorrectly for the state, but he went forward as an authority, and the 718 paper break time went forward as a fact. This timeline supported the state's theory of the bubbler confrontation. Rob, the MeasureX creator, and Connie, the lab tech, would have derailed the state's theory of the case. Another one of the state's key witnesses was James Gilliam, who was in prison at the same time as Ray Moore. James was a career criminal who specialized in robbery and violence, including having stabbed two men at a nightclub. 
James Gilliam's current stint in prison was for threatening his girlfriend with a knife and happened to overlap with Raymore's time in prison. James testified that Ray had confessed to him that he helped brutalize Monfiles. The prosecution ran with it and made the assertion that since Ray and James were both African Americans, they must have talked with one another in prison. The truth was, Ray never talked to anyone in prison about his case, and he never met James or even remembered seeing him. In exchange for this information, instead of getting jail time for using a butcher knife to threaten his girlfriend when she tried to end their relationship, James walked away with two years of probation. In 2000, James murdered his wife and is now serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. When interviewed in 2012, James admitted that Ray Moore never confessed to murder. In 1997, a new police chief took over Green Bay PD and told Winkler that if he didn't resign, they would terminate him. It was his choice. Officers who got fired from Green Bay PD usually received a three- or four-page letter detailing the issues with their job performance. Detective Winkler received 26 pages outlining his poor performance, including threatening witnesses. This was a significant event especially on the heels of having solved the city's most publicized murder case. Detective Winkler went through a mental health crisis after the Monfiles investigation finished. He filed a psychological disability claim, which was disputed by the city. The report stated that Winkler threatened the person who was handling his disability case, which resulted in disciplinary measures. Winkler and the city eventually came to an agreement. If he went out on permanent disability, they would stop the disciplinary measures. The city of Green Bay agreed to pay him $60,000 per year, tax-free. The question centering around Randy Winkler was why would a detective conduct themselves in such a dishonest and fraudulent way? In one short word, fame. In 1981, Ron and Yvonne Rickman had been arguing while heading out to Appleton to go shopping. They were so annoyed with each other that when they arrived at the shopping destination, they went their separate ways, to each shop alone and in peace. At the end of the day, Ron waited in the car for his wife, but 48-year-old Yvonne never showed up. Ron was obviously a suspect, but there was never any evidence, there was no murder weapon, and they never found her body. Later on, they arrested Ron for the illegal possession of a hunting rifle, which included some jail time. Enter Detective Randy Winkler. A jailhouse informant said Ron confessed to him that he killed his wife. They convicted Ron based on that evidence, and they sentenced him to life in prison for murder. In 1994, they turned the story into a movie called The Disappearance of Vani. Randy Winkler, the small-town cop from Gillette, Wisconsin, was thrust into the spotlight. He was so proud of this accomplishment that he told Mike Pye, that it took him years for him to get Ron Rickman, and he would get Pi too. But it was easy for Green Bay PD to use Randy Winkler as a scapegoat, as if Randy Winkler was the only bad seed in a good bunch of apples. Just like any workplace, the actions of that bad seed don't go unnoticed by peers or management. And Green Bay had other bad seeds on their team. Prosecutor John Zakowski had tunnel vision, and was hell-bent on getting that round peg into a square hole. John Zakowski was under a lot of community pressure to wrap up one of the largest cases in Green Bay history and the biggest case of his career. He contended that there were people at James River who were covering up for the murder and were not coming forward to confirm the bubbler confrontation. The salt-of-the-earth Wisconsin paper mill worker was not coming forward due to the Brotherhood of the Union risking their high-paying jobs to cover up a murder. D.A. Zakowski disregarded statements from mill workers who were smoking at a table near the Monfiles' work area and would have seen a bubbler confrontation had one really happened. Zakowski knew that there were problems with Detective Winkler and his methods, but he said that Winkler was cross-examined at trial by excellent defense attorneys, and that was good enough for him. Not only did Zakowski charge the six men with murder, 
He added misdemeanor charges as an insurance plan to get the men on something. The misdemeanor trial was set two weeks prior to the murder trial, which put the defense attorneys at a disadvantage for preparing for the murder trial. The original misdemeanor charges were injury to business and restraint of will. They reduced the charges to forfeiture. Pye and Kutzka pleaded no contest, just so their attorneys could focus on the murder trial. All six men had a joint trial. D.A. Zakowski pushed for it, and the judge granted it. The judge agreed with saving money for the taxpayers, and he did not want to put the Monfiles family through six trials. This also meant that Brian's Fox Den story could be used against all the men, not just Keith Kutzka. If there were separate trials, everyone except Kutzka would not have been convicted. Brian Kellner tried to tell authorities that the Fox Den story wasn't true, and he also said this while he was in D.A. Zakowski's office. But that didn't sway the D.A. In court, Zakowski said there was no DNA found at the scene of the beating because Keith had cleaned the area with a high-pressure hose. But just like the bubbler confrontation, there were no witnesses to this cleaning. When Michael Johnson, one of the Monfile Six, left work one day, he was interviewed by one of the Green Bay news stations asking if he knew Thomas Monfiles. He said that he did, and that Monfiles was the popcorn man. Johnson was actually mistaken, and the person he knew was Jim Butcher. Jim was known as the popcorn man because he made bags of popcorn for the people who passed through his work area. Jim used to directly work with Monfiles on Paper Machine 7, so it was easy to get the two confused. D.A. Zakowski used the tape against Johnson in court, even after knowing that this was an honest mistake. What happened to the Monfile Six, who were all convicted in October 1995? They ordered Mike Piaskowski to be released from prison on January 9, 2001. Five federal judges ruled that his conviction was based on inadequate evidence. One judge criticized D.A. Zakowski and said that his largest victory for this case was using conjecture, camouflaged as evidence. Zakowski was stacking or pyramiding inferences meaning that he stacked one inference over another until he came to the conclusion without having first-hand evidence. It's akin to playing the telephone game. The judge also found that the jury was irrational and unreasonable. They failed their duty. Mike Pye was no longer a felon and had his constitutional rights restored. The jury has mostly kept quiet because they did not want to relive this trial and their decision. One jury member, however, offered an apology. Mike knows that all the men were innocent and never hurt Tom Monfiles, including Keith Kutzka. But he also blames Keith for putting the events into motion that led to Tom's death. Keith is arrogant and self-centered. From getting the tape from the police to playing it at work for Monfiles, everyone has lost everything. Mike has no love for Keith, but he will also defend Keith's innocence. They release Dale Baston from prison in September 2017, at age 76. They paroled him due to medical problems because prison staff could no longer care for him. He went to a care facility where he could be monitored. At that point, Dale couldn't remember people or even knew who he was. Dale passed away last year at age 77. His brother had said that prison aged Dale because of the additional stress and lack of human contact. Dale had a heart attack in prison, and Steph had not even immediately contacted his family. Mike Hearn was released December 2018 at age 55. Ray Moore and Michael Johnson were released in July 2019 at 72 and 71, respectively. Keith Kutzka is still behind bars. He has petitioned to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, which was denied in 2017. In 2019, We understand the elements of a wrongful conviction. Defendants won't take a plea deal. Law enforcement hold on to one theory and ignore evidence that doesn't fit that theory. Cross-racial witness identifications that are incorrect. And the use of jailhouse informants. Most criminal cases never go to trial, and defendants end up taking a plea deal. Innocent people will often draw a line in the sand and refuse to take a deal, even when the stakes are high. None of the six men ever took a deal. Green Bay PD and the DA 
held on to a theory like a dog with a bone, and did not test other evidence that didn't fit that theory. Keith Kutzka was a reasonable starting point for their investigation, but why wasn't Dave Weiner investigated, given his homicide conviction? The prosecution's case was built on stacking inferences and secondhand conjecture from a man who had been drinking and had a good reason to save his own hide. The DA presented non-experts as experts and trusted a detective who used inappropriate interview techniques and altered police reports. Jailhouse informants, James Gilliam, and Dave Weiner were significant witnesses for the state. Both received lesser sentences, and James later admitted that his testimony was not true. Plus, he went on to murder his wife. A newer white employee to James River said he spotted Ray Moore by the vat, but he had really seen someone other than Ray, who was also African American. Based on that, police accused Ray Moore of lying when the timeline of his whereabouts differed from this newer employee's. The media play a major role in wrongful convictions. Just look at Amanda Knox, the Central Park Five, or the Duke Lacrosse case. Media helped convict them in the court of public opinion and demonized the defendants regardless of their proof of innocence. Local news stations, WLUK, WFRV, WBAY, WGBA, and the Green Bay Press Gazette were all complicit in creating hype around this case but how deeply did they report on the issues with the state's witnesses or theories? How much coverage did they give to Mike Pye's exoneration? James River Paper Company also deserves part of the blame. In a disciplinary meeting with Keith Kutzka, a male manager told him that the phone call to police came from within the company, which was inappropriate. Instead of protecting their employees, James River invited Detective Randy Winkler into the workplace and even set up an office for him. James River HR acted like investigators and grilled employees, even though they have never been trained to perform police work. They made the message crystal clear. Cooperate with the Green Bay Police, or we will fire you. The question remains, will Keith Kutzka ever get another chance at having a reasonable and fair trial? Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources used in this episode. If you think this case was interesting and you want to go deep, check out the Monfiles Conspiracy book. It's 400 pages and outlines all the problems with this case. It has a floor plan of Tom's work area, and the authors have reconstructed events of that last day, minute by minute. They even have copies of Detective Winkler's altered detail sheets. This case was personal for me, with my ties to Green Bay and James River and I enjoyed putting together this episode. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review in Apple Podcasts. I want to thank the Minds of Madness podcast for becoming a patron of the show. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll talk in a few weeks. I am get to worry I call this my home You say it seems lonely Where I belong I keep my head clear I keep my heart full strong There's one long straight road here I cannot go wrong The road keeps me younger I promise it's where I belong